وصحبه وسلم seems through reading some of these questions that with all due respect some people have not it seems to me listened to perhaps a single word that I have said I will start with this first question because it is reflective of the attitudes of a large number of extremely ignorant misguided people who seem to understand relatively little about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he expects from us and what it means to be a worshipper of Allah it seems they understand relatively little of what truly constitutes the path to paradise and the path to hellfire and unfortunately they seem to understand even less what are the causes of the destruction and the decline of the Muslims and our position of weakness and humiliation although I have mentioned in my talk the authentic sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the pronouncements of his companions who were the most knowledgeable the most God-fearing and the best of all of the human beings after the messengers This is what the brother or the sister says Brother, the youth, and in brackets Majority of the audience Came to learn how to love Allah And his messenger Not to be told about bid'a And relatively insignificant issues While our fellow Muslims all over the world are being slaughtered Please advise those who want to learn about their faith Well, the first person I would like to advise is this individual Shall we just go back? Let's read what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Now if this particular individual who wrote this question does not know who Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is because he or she is so ridiculously ignorant then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he's not only one of the companions of the Prophet he is one of the greatest scholars amongst the Sahaba He found people sitting in the mosque in his time counting dhikr with beads in a way I mean, what appears to you and me a relatively insignificant innovation I mean certainly compared with many of the things that people say and do today but when he Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion of the Prophet saw this, his words were O Ummah of Muhammad, how soon you are destroyed I don't really know how to explain it much more if you think that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did not understand the religion he was ignorant why did he waste his time with relatively insignificant matters but he did not consider it insignificant he actually pointed out in his statement that this was the cause of the destruction of the Muslims it was the cause of the destruction of the Muslims do you think it is insignificant O oh brother, O oh sister who wrote this particular question 
that on the day of judgment that when people will come to drink from the fountain al kawthar that after which you will drink you will never be thirsty again that as they are coming and some people will come and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will recognize them by their arms and their faces shining where they used to make wudu but the angels will come and make a barrier between them and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet will say these are my people, these are my people and the angels will say no you don't know what new things they innovated after you and the Prophet will say be gone, be gone be gone with the innovators is that insignificant? is it insignificant that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he will not accept the tawbah the repentance of the innovator until he abandons his innovation is that insignificant? is what Imam Malik one of the great Imams of this Ummah one of the Imams of the four famous schools of thought is what he said insignificant that those people who introduce innovations are accusing Muhammad of having betrayed his trust is that insignificant if I stood up to say today and say Muhammad was a failure he betrayed his trust he didn't complete what he was supposed to do subhanallah wouldn't that be extreme kufr you think Allah will give victory to me would he make me triumphant or would he humiliate me and punish me you tell me why do you think the Muslims are in the condition they are today why do you think we are humiliated why do you think we are downtrodden why do you think we are being massacred why do you think it's happening what because of the plots of the CIA the Masons but Allah says in the Quran that the plots of the Kafirs will have no effect against you if you are believers they will do you nothing except a little bit of harm but if we disobey Allah we become sinful we turn to sins and disobedience if we fall into shirk and innovation destroying the religion of Islam then Allah he will destroy us and this is what has happened and this is what is happening innovations are worse than major sins they are worse than stealing and fornicating killing lying cheating backbiting innovations are worse than that the Prophet said the worst thing in the religion are the newly in, uh, innovated matters I began my talk with that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to begin every single nearly every single talk he gave with the khutbat al hajjah which is what I began my talk with and in that he would say the worst thing the worst thing in the religion are the newly innovated matters so when I brought up this issue it is extremely important to the condition of the Muslims the reason we find ourselves in the position that we are today is because of our sins it is because of our disobedience to Allah it is because of our abandoning his religion that's the reason that's why we need to talk about these things that's why we will never be rectified we will never be in a good condition until we return to that which the Prophet and his companions were upon that's what Imam Malik said nothing will reform the end of this ummah except except that which reformed the beginning of this ummah look to the companions 
Look how Islam was spread under them and how Allah honored the Muslims under them and humiliated the disbelievers under them. And look at us. Why do you think it is that we find ourselves in the condition that we are today? Have you not read the Quran? Why don't you just pick it up and read it, whoever wrote this question? Haven't you read what happened to the Bani Israel? People who had messengers, who believed in Allah, who claimed to follow their messengers, but what did they do? What happened to them? What did Allah do to them? Didn't Allah mention that He sent against them some of His servants? And they entered into the innermost recesses of their homes? Weren't they taken into captivity? Weren't they considered the most despised people on the face of the earth? Why? Because of their disobedience to Allah. Because of their changing Allah's religion. Saying this is Allah when it is not from Allah. This is the reason. Do you think Allah mentioned these things so we could have nice stories to tell our children when we went to bed? This is there to teach us so we shouldn't fall into the same thing. Do you think, brothers and sisters, Allah is going to support the Muslims when with their actions they insult Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by abandoning his sunnah, filling their, act, their, their lives with innovations? Will Allah support these people? Will Allah give them victory? I don't think so. So if you are someone who wants to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have to follow his sunnah. And you have to be aware of what contradicts that. Yes, you must believe in him and his guidance. This is what it means to follow his sunnah. This is what it means to love him. And to follow his sunnah means to be far away from innovation. This is what I came here to teach people. It wasn't only a talk about bid'ah that constituted maybe 10 minutes at the end of my talk. But it was part of it that is relevant. And... As I said, Kul, as I didn't say, Allah said, Kul in kuntum tahibbun Allah, fattabiyuni. Someone jazakallah corrected me. Yahbibkum Allah. The Prophet has been told to say, If you love Allah, follow me, then Allah will love you. So loving Allah is achieved by following the Prophet. This is how we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How we manifest the reality of the love of Allah And that is how Allah will love us And this sort of comes to Another question <laughs> so, You know Someone is asking Isn't it good enough to have a good heart You know Just to have a good heart Because uh, Doesn't Allah look at your hearts And not your appearance Well you know what this hadith means Is that it's not relevant to Allah whether you are dressed in beautiful clothes having a beautiful appearance whether you look like a supermodel or a movie star this is not what concerns Allah what concerns Allah is your heart this does not mean that Allah is not concerned with your actions your appearance whether the people consider you handsome or ugly it's not irrelevant it's irrelevant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is important is your heart, but your heart, your heart, the qalb, the heart. This is made pure through the actions of obedience to Allah. The righteous actions, the amal salih the righteous actions that are done sincerely and purely for the pleasure of Allah. You will only ever have a good heart by worshipping Allah. The way he wants to be worshipped. By praying the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ. In the manner of the Prophet 
fasting, giving zakah, doing the pilgrimage, being kind to your parents, your neighbors, and so on and so forth. This is how you get a good heart. Reading the Quran, making the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with acts of obedience to Him. This is how you get a good heart. Right, next question. What is the position of the scholars with regards to taqlid of madhabs? Given that both Ibn Taymiyyah and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab both claim to be of the Hanbali school of fiqh. Also, Ibn al Qayyim al Jawzi said, The people are the sheep of the scholar. If this is not valid to be a Hanafi or whatever, why did the Salaf openly claim membership to madhabs? Even Ibn Baz, even Ibn Baz has said he is a scholar of the Hanbali school. Well, did Let's actually examine this question and see that does one thing necessarily follow from the other. The, the questioner asks, what is the position of the scholars with regards to taqlid of madhabs? Right? So now you bring in this issue of taqlid of madhabs and then you say quite rightly that Muhammad ibn Abdul Hab and Ibn Taymiyyah and other scholars claim to be followers of the Hanafi, uh, the, sorry, the Hanbali madhab. This is true. But they did not claim to make taqlid of the Hanbali madhab, which is blind following, which is two completely different things. I never stated at any time that there is any problem with anybody following a madhab. There is no problem with anybody following a madhab. If you want to base your actions upon the opinions of a scholar, and you base your research into the book and the sunnah based upon the method derived and taught by a scholar this is no problem the problem arises however when you obstinately cling to the position of what you call your madhab when there is a clear authentic hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that contradicts that position and that clear authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been well explained and adequately proven by a competent scholar to contradict the position of your madhab but when you continue to blindly adhere to what your madhab is teaching in opposition to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then this now becomes a problem this is what is not accepted. It is the fanatical, bigoted following of the madhabs that is not allowed. That is not allowed. That's the first thing. Secondly, when people say, I am a Hanafi. Well, actually, what do people mean? I am a Hanafi. Are they following the opinions of Abu Hanifa? They are not. Eighty percent of the opinions of Abu Hanifa have been rejected by the Hanafi Madhab in fact by his own students which make up much of what is the Hanafi Madhab they went against the rulings of Abu Hanifa so what do you mean you're following most people when they say I'm a Hanafi they don't actually know what are the rulings of the Hanafi Madhab what are the opinions of Abu Hanifa and what are the evidences that he bought in order to support his position Abu Hanifa himself said, it is haram for anybody to follow my opinion unless he knows the evidences that constitute my opinion. Abu Hanifa himself said, if you find an authentic hadith that contradicts my opinion, leave my opinion and follow the authentic hadith. That is the madhab of Abu Hanifa. That is why Imam an nawawi for example, who was a Shafi, in other words, he followed the collection of rulings of the Shafi Madhab and the means of understanding or deriving the rulings from Imam Shafi. But he used to say concerning a certain position, 
This is the opinion of, or this is the position of Imam Shafi, even though it wasn't. That was not actually what Imam Shafi said one should do. But he said that why? Because the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ stated that. And he said that Imam Shafi said, the authentic hadith is my madhab. Okay? So in fact we find that the scholars, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Abu Hanifa, fundamentally and basically their attitude and their understanding was the same. But what the people today have made of these scholars is something different. Please recall those verses I read. When those who were followed will denounce those who followed them. And the people will say, we wish we had made ourselves free from them as they have made themselves free from us. How many people who claim to be followers, I wonder how many people will stand on the Day of Judgment who call themselves Hanafis and Abu Hanifa will make himself completely free from them. How many people who call themselves Shafis, Imam al-Shafi will make himself completely free from them. How many people who call themselves Malikis and Hanbalis that Ahmed ibn Hanbal and Imam Malik will make themselves completely free from them I wonder so the call is to obey Allah and obey the messenger not to abandon the scholars not to look into the scholars and their opinions because they are the inheritors of the knowledge they are the inheritors of the Prophet and the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ is the knowledge. The scholars are to be respected. They are to be followed. Yes. They are to be followed. And as for the saying of Ibn al-Qayyim al Josi that the people concerning the scholars is sheep, what does this mean? It means, brothers and sisters, that if you go to a scholar, a scholar, and you are an ignorant person, or even you may be knowledgeable but you don't feel you have the ability to understand completely and correctly a certain issue you go to a scholar and you say to that scholar oh scholar I mean I'm not saying you say oh scholar but you, you say right you will ask them I want to know about this and that what should I do about this and that what is your ruling so the scholar will say my ruling is that you should do that once the scholar has given you a ruling, you are obliged to act upon the fatwa of that scholar. Until or unless another scholar comes and he says to you and proves to you that the opinion of that scholar was wrong based upon an authentic evidence. Then you change. Otherwise you must stick to the saying of that scholar in that sense. The ignorant people are dependent upon the scholars for their religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I can't read that. Oh dear. Yes, some Muslims gather people and give Islamic speeches on the birthday of the Prophet is it allowed? now it is the opinion of the scholar the Imam as Sayyuti and may Allah be pleased with him it is his opinion that it is a good thing to gather on the day of the Prophet Wasallam's birthday and to read from his seerah and so on and so forth in other words to make something that you will benefit from reminding yourself about the Prophet ﷺ. he did not mention or you know approve of what the people do today by way of you know singing and dancing and making parades in the street and beating on all the stuff that they do right however you know this was his opinion and many other scholars disagreed with him and said this is incorrect 
and said that no day should be specified or chosen specifically to do this this is something that should be done generally by the Muslims all the time and that to specify such a day that was not specified by the Prophet or his companions is a bid'ah this is what I believe the second opinion is what is the correct opinion it is an innovation to do that and if it was something good then those who are better than us the Sahaba they would have been the first people to do that however since none of them none of them did it at all then it is something that they never did and it's something that we should never do because what was not deen with them how can it be deen with us if it was not religion with them how will it be religion with us so uh, Allah knows best Hmm. That's a difficult question that one. <laughs> Christians say God is love. What is the aspect of Islam comparing with our topic loving of God and his prophet? Well, the problem is that if you say God is love, you come across a type of what we could call a logical you know difficulty a difficulty in logic here and I remember once quite a while ago I was invited to Cambridge to a conference that was held there on just broadly on religious education and amongst them were some monsignors who are people who are attached to cardinals and there's one particular Roman Catholic uh, priest that I was talking to at the time he came up with this I can't remember in the course of the conversation that God is love I said well if you say God is love people love drugs people love alcohol people love to murder people love to rape so is that God he said well I suppose maybe in a sort of way and then he said I don't think we should think about that too much so the problem is that in fact if you say God is love you are confronted with a huge range of theological problems in order to explain this if God is love totally and completely love how do you actually explain all the suffering in the world for example this becomes a big problem and it's a problem for Christians however if you rather say God is loving as we believe Allah is loving he is not love but he is loving he is loving he is merciful he is compassionate this is a m correct way to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah Akbar as Muslims can we say we love the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and wear western clothing that does not cover our aura Allah Akbar uh, it's not you know um, of course it's not right that any Muslim should uh, not cover their aura you know every Muslim should cover their aura and they should be shy and they should be you know ashamed to expose their nakedness because that's what it is in front of people however the fact that you are for example committing some sins does not mean that you are absolutely disqualified from being somebody who loves the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam of course you must understand that the reality of loving the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and loving Allah and his messenger both of them is in following is in obedience this is what the meaning of love 
in respect to Allah and the Messenger means. It is not like an attachment or some mere emotional attachment like you might have for your dog or a particular teapot or something like that. Okay? You may love it, you know, you may have an affection for it, okay? Whatever. Right? But the love for Allah and the Messenger is a different type of love. It is a love of submission. It's a love of submission. And what is important first and foremost is that you understand that. You comprehend that reality. However, all of us are going to fall short. All of us are going to fall short. This is not an encouragement to sin because you will always feel ashamed of your sin. And you will always wish and hope and yearn that you will change and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change you and improve your condition. But in this regard, we must mention one very beautiful and one very important hadith. In fact, I wish I could end it on this hadith because it is so beautiful. And I'd like, I wish I could end it so we could all go and have this beautiful thought in our head. There was once a man when the Prophet wasallam they went out on an expedition for jihad. And there was a man amongst the companions at that time. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, when is the last day? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Woe be to you. What have you prepared for it? What have you prepared for it? And the man said, O Messenger of Allah, I have not prepared much by way of prayers and fasting. But I love Allah and His Messenger. And the Prophet ﷺ said, You will be with those you love. You will be with those you love. And the companion said, who narrated the hadith, we were not as happy about anything when we heard this except on the except the day that we embraced Islam. There's nothing that made them as happy hearing this except the day they actually embraced Islam. That you will be with the people you love. So this love that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you will be with those you love that is because this love to be with the believers this love for Allah and His Messenger is a love that is for the sake of Allah and for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is a love for the believers a love for the Prophet a love to be with the believers a love to be with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is born out of the fact that these are the people of At-Tawheed. These are the worshippers of Allah in His oneness. These are the people who are far away from shirk and disbelief. So it is a love that is for the sake of Allah. And whoever loves for the sake of Allah, then Allah will love that person. And indeed, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, that you will never taste Halwatul Iman, the sweetness of faith. You will never taste the sweetness of faith. Even if you fast and you pray and you give charity. Until you love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until you love and hate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is, insha'Allah, something that we should all try to acquaint ourselves with. Try to imbibe ourselves with. The love for the Prophet wasallam, and the love for the companions of the Prophet and the love for the family of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Because these are the people who Allah's Messenger loved. And these are the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself loves. And if we love them, and we love their actions, we love the things that they did, we love the things that we said, then Alhamdulillah, inshallah, Allah will love us. And if we truly love them, brothers and sisters, if we truly love them, may Allah have mercy on you, surely we will try to be like them. Not only in character, in ibadah, 
but also even in outward appearance and that's something that we all see and we all experience how many people who are devoted followers of Madonna or Michael Jackson right want to look exactly like them and dress exactly like them and this is actually born out of their obsession and their love for these people so therefore it is something good out of love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to want to adopt his appearance alhamdulillah this is something good certainly you will want to adopt the dress of the believing men and the believing women this is something that will be in your heart and inshallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all of us towards that Allah Akbar how should a Muslim who has veered off from Islam repent and go back to the proper way of Islam please advise well the first thing is of course to realize and to understand with knowledge that you have done something wrong so this is the first thing to recognize your error the second thing that you need to do is one should feel remorse you should feel remorse for the sin that you have committed and the misguidance that you have been upon the third thing is that you should determine you should determine in your heart strongly with a firm intention that you will leave that error and you will leave that misguidance and that you will turn to knowledge and you will turn to correct guidance so this is the firm intention and the absolute resolve to abandon what Allah hates and what he is displeased with and to go to that which Allah loves and which he is pleased with then you should supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calling upon him begging him for his forgiveness and you should also remove yourself from that environment which is causing you to go astray from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there may be something or some people or some environment that is leading you to this bad situation so you should remove yourself from that and inshallah this is the path of sincere and true repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay we'll answer that one okay uh, there's two questions I've had about what is the difference between Shia and Sunni um and another question here um, what are they following and, and what are the uh, innovations they have followed something of the fourth caliph Ali now the era of the Shia in the time of Ali ibn Talib was their excessive love and their excessive attachment to Ali ibn Talib an excessive attachment and love that led them to exaggerate to such an extent that they made claims concerning Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman that Ali ibn Talib himself never agreed or approved of that they claimed that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman had purposefully denied and deprived Abi Ali ibn Talib of the Khilafah to be the Emir of the Muslims and that he should have been the rightful ruler of the Muslims from the beginning and that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman had deprived them of that 
this led to exaggeration and exaggeration and it grew and grew and grew to the extent that they actually began to proclaim that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman in fact all of the companions of the Prophet except five or ten of them had actually become murtad they had apostatized from the religion of Islam and they call them Taghut, false gods so this clearly contradicts the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and actually it really contradicts you know any type of reasonable assessment of the reality of the situation and like every single innovation it started as something relatively small and relatively minor but it grew to be something big and something major and as one follows one innovation then other innovations start to accumulate and surround until in the beginning the Shia were only disagreeing with the companions of the Prophet and the majority of the, or the rest of the other Muslims on this issue they were disagreeing on this issue however as time progressed the divide became greater and greater and greater until in fact in reality we find that the whole fundamental understanding of some of the principles of Islam began to be completely different so for example we find a large group of the Shia not all of them but a large group of the Shia for example believe in 12 infallible Imams they believe that these Imams are absolutely infallible that they have complete knowledge of everything that happened in the past that happens in the present and that will happen in the future they actually claim some of them that they have control over the atoms of the universe in fact this is something Khomeini wrote in one of his books that the twelve Imams they have control over the atoms of the universe and that they have knowledge of everything of all the unseen and they claim they are infallible in other words what they say is that unlike the people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah who believe that the last infallible human being was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in fact infallibility in matters of the religion is a prophetic quality it's something that only belongs to the messengers no human being it is impossible for any human being to be infallible after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he is the last messenger of God in reality anybody who believes that somebody is infallible after the Prophet in reality believes in a Prophet after the Prophet even if he does not call that person a messenger of God they actually believe that that person has a quality that is only belonging to the messenger of God for example if I said about myself Anna al haq I am the truth if I said this about myself I would be claiming for myself one of the attributes that is a unique attribute that only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I didn't call myself al khaliq I didn't call myself al rabb I didn't call myself by the other attributes of Allah I call myself an al haq I am the truth It still makes me someone who is claiming to be a rival to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Because I have claimed for myself one of Allah's attributes Therefore I have made myself equal with Him Therefore I have made shirk and I have denied La ilaha illallah similarly anybody who says that such and such is infallible and that everything they say is correct and right and they are incapable of making a mistake and they should be absolutely adhered to unquestioningly in matters of religion 
then they have in fact claimed for that person a quality that is only belonging to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even if they did not call that person a prophet. And by that, in reality, they have denied the second part of the kalima, Muhammad Rasulullah. So this is just one example of amongst the major deviation that some of the people who call themselves Shia have suffered upon you know in this day and age and in fact throughout the ages so this is just an example of that but as I mentioned the initial deviation was a small one in respect to the position of Ali but then it grew and grew and changed and changed until it became something extremely major Allah Akbar My doctor appears to believe in a religion called love and says God is in a form of man. He claims in the year 2000 everyone will know that God will come and be seen. What do you have to say? I suggest your doctor should go and see a psychiatrist. There's a questioner here who says there are people who say they love Allah um, and they are from, and he mentions uh, well, uh, Sufis, Shias, grave worshippers, money worshippers who do not follow many of the Prophet's Sunnah. Do they really love Allah? Some claim to have seen the Prophet in their dreams. Is this a criterion of love? Mm. Well, one of the things that I think is worth mentioning here is that what we do not accept what we do not accept is the belief of some people who claim that the only way to really reach the true pure love of Allah is through what they call or what they believe is some direct experience some direct mystical experience or union or direct what they may think is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other words they think that Allah can only be known through this direct experience and that his love can only be reached through this this is complete misguidance it has nothing to do with the religion of Islam and this is the position of many not all many not all of the people who claim to follow Sufism for example but the word Sufism actually encompasses a large different variety of beliefs and practices so it can be sometimes a bit dangerous to plaster a big label over a group of people like that however definitely if people believe that through meditation or just merely repeating the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and somehow trying to achieve this mystical union or direct experience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will uh, reach the state of you know uh, gnosis that they want to achieve or whatever this is not from the religion of Islam this is Gnosticism this is part of Hinduism uh, and uh, this is part of false religion we have already detailed quite clearly we have detailed quite clearly in the talk and we mentioned the hadith of the Prophet the hadith Qudsi that the Prophet said that Allah said my slave does not draw close to me with anything except those deeds or those things which I have made an obligation upon him 
So there is nothing with which you can draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except through the obligatory actions. And then you increase upon those obligatory actions until you reach a state of complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the most perfect and complete state that the human being can achieve in relationship to understanding Allah. It is the position of complete submission when you realize, you realize actually in your actions as well as in your mind and your heart that you are the slave of Allah. You are the slave of Allah. And the early Sufis or people who are called Sufis such as for example Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jalani, who is one of the Imams of guidance of this Ummah although he used some of the terms that for example are used by the later day Sufis like Fana he did not mean what they give it some of the, the latter day Sufis they say Fana means you become one with Allah literally they mean you merge with Allah you become Allah and Allah becomes you so there is no difference between you and Allah okay Sheikh Abdul, Abdul Qadir al did not mean this. They, the early Sufis, understood this or they used this term for now to mean the state of complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Sheikh Abdul Qadir al was a very firm follower of the aqidah, the belief of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And he was very strong in saying that this is the correct belief. So obviously, in reality we find that the true love for Allah can only be achieved through the correct knowledge of Him the correct understanding of His names and His attributes contemplating upon them and understanding the reality of how they manifest themselves in the creation this is one of the paths to, the, to, to developing within yourself the love for Allah reading the Quran contemplating upon Allah's names and his attributes and how they manifest themselves in the creation look at the alternation of the night and the day look at the ships that sail through the mercy of Allah for the bounty of mankind so on and so forth through contemplating upon these you understand the generosity of Allah the mercy of Allah the forgiveness of Allah by seeing how Allah dealt with the people who disobeyed him you understand the wrath of Allah the anger of Allah so on and so forth this is how you get to know your Lord. This is how you tread on the path that will lead you to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that manifests itself through you doing acts of obedience to Him. Those acts of obedience, we know it from, as I've already mentioned, the revelation. It may be possible that some people who belong to these groups or sects, because of their ignorance, they earnestly do love Allah and they earnestly seek to worship Allah but they may be ignorant they may not have access to the full and correct knowledge but indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful and just so surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help them and guide them and not deprive them of being amongst those who love Him if they are truly sincere truly sincere and they truly do their best to follow the correct approach so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But we want to say generally, generally as a general thing, no. In general, to love Allah, you must believe in Allah the way He wants you to believe in Him. You must understand His names and attributes in the correct way. You must follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam correctly, abandoning and being far away from the innovations. Not only abandoning them and being far away from them, but also fighting against those either verbally or in your heart or even physically against those people who are the supporters of the innovations as the Prophet mentioned I mentioned the hadith if you remember from Sahih Muslim the Prophet said and whoever fights jihad against them with his hand is a believer whoever fights jihad against them with his tongue is a believer whoever fights jihad against them with his heart is a believer after that there is not a mustard seed's worth of faith let the first person whose question I read think about that hadith as well since it is referring to the people of innovation hmm. okay 
good question here. I don't really, you yeah. Many of us shave our beards or take off hijab because our parents, husbands, wife, etc. told us to. What advice do you have for such people? You see, brothers and sisters, I know that some people do not understand. And I, you know, I don't know if they purposefully and willfully don't understand or maybe they never really thought about it. But some people say, oh, you know, I can't wear hijab because my mother told me this and that, or I can't. Or I can't do this because my father told me. Or I have to do this because my parent or my wife or my husband or whatever. But let us go back and remind ourselves of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there is no obedience to the creation in disobedience to Allah. So it is never permissible that you should obey your parents when they order you to disobey Allah. Yes, Allah has ordered you to obey your parents. But why do you obey your parents? You obey your parents because Allah has told you to. It is an order from Allah. That's the reason why you obey them. Because you are a believer in Allah and a worshipper of Him. So what? how could it possibly be that if your parents order you to do something sinful, that you follow them in that? Or your husband orders you to do something sinful and you obey him in that? Or your wife orders you to do something sinful and you obey them in that? Or your ruler orders you to do something sinful and you obey them in that? No. Never. The fact that somebody in authority over you has ordered you to do something, if that order involves disobedience to Allah, you must not obey them. You must not obey them. Because obedience to Allah is above obedience to any of the creation. Obedience to Allah is above obedience to any of the creation. So this is not an excuse for anyone. It is not an excuse for anyone. Just one more question and that's it. Um, okay. I think this is a worthwhile one here, inshallah, and then we'll finish it there. Could you please clarify the difference between innovation in matters of worship and worldly matters? This is a good point and it's an important topic. Inshallah, I won't take long to cover it. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Man amala amalan laysa alayhi amruna fuhuwa rad." Whoever introduces into this matter of ours something that is not from it will have it rejected. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam specified, in reality, something. He said, "This matter of ours, this our affair." So there is something that the Prophet ﷺ was specifying. He didn't say, whoever introduces anything into anything will have it rejected. No. He said, into this matter of ours. And the matter that is the matter of the Prophet ﷺ is the matter of the religion of Islam. It's the matter of the deen. So when a group of people who were cross fertilizing their date palms they were being observed by the Prophet ﷺ. and when the Prophet saw it he said maybe it is better that you didn't do that so when the Prophet said that to them they stopped and after some time some years they found that the yield of their crop decreased so they came to the Prophet and they told him and, they, and the Prophet ﷺ said In these affairs of the world 
I am just like you. I am a man just like you. It is merely my opinion. If I just give my opinion, then you know better concerning your affairs. But if I tell you something concerning the religion, then you must obey it. So the issue or the affair of the Prophet ﷺ was in that which he commanded concerning the religion. So this therefore does not constitute those things concerning, for example, the radio or the motor car or the aeroplane. Although these are innovations in the linguistic sense of the word, what is meant by what the Prophet ﷺ called innovation that has been forbidden is the innovation in the religion. It is the innovation in the religion, adding new things to the deen. This is the distinction between the two things. So I hope, inshallah, that has been made clear. And I hope, brothers and sisters, inshallah, that all of us, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of us to be His obedient slaves, that we are amongst those who truly love Him and that are truly loved by Him, and that we are amongst those who truly love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that none of you truly believes, none of you truly believes until you love me more than your mother and your father and all of mankind. So we must love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than even our own selves. And I invite you please to look and read to the example of the companions. The companions who laid down their lives, who sacrificed their lives for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. Who when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being attacked and the arrows were being fired, some of them made themselves a shield to protect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the love that they used to have for him. This is the honor that they used to have for him. But the way they honored him and loved him the most was by clinging and adhering to his precious and noble sunnah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Allah.